I want to welcome you all to Living Manor Online Church. Today, we have a very special message. We're going to be looking at Bible prophecy, specifically the prophecy of the 2300 days found in Daniel chapter 8. And so I invite you to pray with me as we get into this very important and timely message today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, Lord, thanking you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace. Lord, as we open your word to look at this subject of the 2300 day prophecy, I pray, Lord, that you would speak and that you would make that which is complex, plain and simple to those desiring truth. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. The subject we're going to be looking at today, once again, is entitled the 2300 day prophecy. And this prophecy uh, is going to take some digging into. And so I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles and we're going to begin in the book of Daniel chapter eight. So let's go to the screen. Beginning in Daniel chapter eight, verse one, the Bible says in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other and the higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. The Bible goes on to say, as I was considering, behold, a he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground and the notable and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that he had that had the two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in his fury of power. And I saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with choler against him and smote the ram and break his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. So what I want you to see here, just as we recap, is that Daniel is seeing a vision. And in this vision, he first sees a, he, a ram that has two horns. One horn is higher than the other. And then he sees a he goat attack the ram. Now, we don't have to go very far to get the meaning of what Daniel is seeing. Because in the very same chapter, Daniel chapter 8 verse 20, an angel begins to explain to Daniel what he is seeing in vision. The angel says, the ram which thou sawest, in verse 20, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So now we know that the ram represented the Medo-Persian empire. Well, what about the he-goat? The Bible says in verse 8, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. The angel says, And the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So the angel tells us here that the rough goat represents the kingdom of Greece. He goes on to say that the, that the horn on this rough goat is the first king, which would be Alexander the Great. This is his empire. Verse 22, now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his own power. The Bible is basically telling us that after the death of Alexander the Great, after Alexander dies, his kingdom would be broken up into four sections. So please follow carefully. Daniel 8 verse 9, the Bible goes on to say, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great 
even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, I don't want you to get confused. I don't want you to ask yourself at this point, well, what is all this talking about? We simply want to see that that what Daniel is catching in vision is first the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the rise of the Grecian Empire. That Grecian Empire breaks down into four different divisions, and then his attention is brought to this little horn that rises after these four kingdoms. This little horn is going to be the focus of our study. The Bible says, as the angel is explaining to Daniel about this little horn, the angel says in Daniel 8, verse 23, and in the latter time of their kingdom, that is the four kingdoms that came after the death of Alexander the Great, when the transgressors are come to the full, meaning when their kingdoms are about to end and another kingdom will rise in its place, the Bible says a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. He shall be mighty or his power and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall he destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Now, what I want you to understand here is that this prince of princes is none other than Jesus Christ. So whatever this power is, whoever this power is, this power will stand against Jesus himself. Please keep that in mind as we go on. Looking at the history of this, what I want you to see, once again, look at the screen. You have Alexander the Great, the kingdom of Greece, which came after the Medo-Persian Empire. After Alexander the Great dies, his kingdom is broken into four different divisions. This is represented by the four horns. Those divisions were the, the Ptolemaic Empire or the Seleucid Empire. Those four divisions were the divisions of the Ptolemy Empire, the Seleucid Empire, Lysimachus's Empire, and Cassander's Empire. These were the four generals that divided the kingdom of Greece amongst themselves as the Bible prophesied. The Bible then tells us that another kingdom would arise after these four kingdoms. And what I need you to see here is this. Each one of these horns represented an empire. Just as Alexander the Great represented the empire of Greece, and then these four horns rep represented different empires. So the little horn represents an empire, not an individual. So y'all put a one in the chat if that makes sense to you. This little horn, which waxes exceeding great, must represent an empire, just like the Medo-Persian Empire, just like the Grecian Empire, just like the Ptolemaic Empire, the Seleucid Empire. Just as Lysimachus' empire and just as Cassander's empire, which covered the area of Macedonia, Lysimachus covering the area of Thrace, these were, were kings who, who occupied territories that became empires. And so this little horn power in Daniel 8 must also represent a kingdom. All right, let's keep moving. I want you to note here, that it is under this context that the Bible says in Daniel 8, 13, and 14, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? In other words, 
Daniel is hearing the question being asked, how long is this vision concerning the, 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 the he-goat and the ram and these four kingdoms and this little horn that rises out, uh, uh, rises after these kingdoms that does these things to the sanctuary and, and to the people of God. How long is this going to last? And the answer comes back onto 2,300 days or 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is the folk of, of, of our study. Who is this little horn and what does it mean unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So let's recap. In Daniel 8, what we see, take a look at the screen, is Medo-Persia, Greece, followed by four kingdoms within Greece, and then a little horn kingdom and then the 2300 days. Medo-Persia, Greece, and the little horn appears to come on the scene after Greece. Now, we're gonna pause here. We're not gonna go to the book of Daniel chapter seven. You may ask, Pastor, why are we going to the book of Daniel chapter seven if we're studying Daniel chapter eight? And the reason we're going to the book of Daniel chapter seven is because there is a little horn in Daniel chapter seven as well. So please follow along and note with me in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. The Bible says here, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now we already know that if in Daniel 8, these beasts represented kingdoms, the, 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 the he-goat and the ram, if they represented kingdoms, then we also know that in Daniel chapter 7, these four great beasts must represent kingdoms. Let's go on, keep reading. Daniel 7 verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings were plucked up as it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it raised itself up on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads. Remember that. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Verse seven, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. And now notice this, verse eight. And as I considered the horns, behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, please note here that in Daniel chapter seven, we have a little horn. And in Daniel chapter eight, we have a little horn. And, and, and I want you to understand what we're seeing in Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to give you the juice down version of this. You can go anywhere and find this information. This is common knowledge. In Daniel chapter 7, these four beasts represent four kingdoms, but these kingdoms are, are, are parallel in a sense what we see in Daniel chapter 8. The lion represented the Babylonian empire, the empire in which Daniel was living when he received this vision. The bear that is raised up on one side, one side is higher than the other, parallels the, the ram in Daniel chapter 8, which had two horns, one higher than the other. In other words, the, the, the bear of Daniel 7 is Medo-Persia, just as the, the, the ram in Daniel 8 is Medo-Persia. Those two powers parallel. The bear, 
in Daniel 7 is the ram of Daniel 8. And just to verify this, if, if, if the Medo-Persian Empire is followed by the Grecian Empire, we see that in Daniel chapter 7, the leopard with four heads comes after the bear, just as the he-goat in Daniel 8, when that horn is broken, Alexander the Great, it is divided into four kingdoms because of his four generals. So the four heads of Daniel chapter 7 parallel the four horns of Daniel chapter 8. If you're with me so far, put a one in the chat. All I'm showing you is that Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 parallel one another. Daniel 7, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Daniel 8 starts with Medo-Persia and then Greece, and then you have this little horn. Now, here's what I want you to know. In Daniel chapter 7, after the fall of Greece, that fourth beast, that beast with great iron teeth that has 10 horns, represents the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire dominates from around uh, 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 the second century BC all the way up until about 400 to 500 AD. That's a long reign. So, so, so when Rome fell, uh, it fell into 10 different barbarian tribes. And, and these tribes are what is described uh, in, in Daniel 7 as having the 10 horns. So these 10 horns represent Rome after its fall. And now we have the introduction of this little horn. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Because what I want you to note, what I want you to note is that in Daniel 7, the little horn appears to rise after the fall of Rome. In Daniel 8, the little horn appears to arise after the fall of Greece. So what's going on here? Are these two different horns? Is this the same horn, but in different phases? Listen carefully and follow along because what I'm gonna show you is going to give you the understanding necessary to, 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 to grasp the meaning of this 2300 days. So what I want you to note as we recap is very simple. In Daniel chapter seven, the little horn appears to rise after the fall of Rome. But in Daniel chapter 8, the little horn appears to arise after the fall of Greece. How do we make sense? Why is God using the same symbol in these two chapters? Do they not represent the same power? And if so, how is it that in one chapter it says it rises after Rome, but in the other chapter it says it rises after Greece? Hold your thought here. And I want to show you something else in Daniel chapter 7. After Daniel sees, after Daniel sees uh, this, this uh, uh, little horn rise, he then goes on to see this. In Daniel 7 verse 9, he says, I beheld, or I was beholding this little horn till thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Daniel sees... Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome dividing into 10 different uh, barbarian tribes, and then the rise of this little horn. He sees this little horn and he's beholding the little, the little horn and watching it dominate. And then he sees a throne, throne set up and a judgment beginning. Now, here's what I want you to know. In Jeremiah 17, verse 12, the Bible says a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. The Bible equates God's sanctuary with his throne. 
You remember the mercy seat in, 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 uh, which was found in the most holy place of the sanctuary. When we see these thrones set up in Daniel chapter 7, after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, the fall of Rome, these 10 tribes, and then the rise of this little horn, and then this little horn dominates, and then we see God's throne all, all of a sudden coming into the vision. It, it, is, it is pointing us to the sanctuary. Y'all put a five in the chat if you're following this. Daniel 7, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, uh, 10 kingdoms, little horn, and then, the, and then the sanctuary. In Daniel 8, we have Medo, Persia, Greece, the division of Greece, and then this little horn, and then talk of what? The sanctuary. Okay. Let's just go back to the screen. And I want you to note the slide, Daniel chapter seven and Daniel chapter eight compared. This is just for us to recap, okay? In Daniel seven, we got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, 10 kingdoms, little horn, and this time period where the Bible says the little horn Will, will, it, will, will think to change times and laws, persecute the saints of the Most High, and will dominate for a time, times and a half, which would be 1260 days. You find that in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. But when we get to Daniel chapter 8, which is paralleling Daniel 7, what do we see? Medo-Persia, Greece, and then the little horn, and then this time period of 2,300 days. So again, please note, in Daniel 8, the little horn appears to rise after Greece, but in Daniel 7, the little horn appears to rise after Rome. What's going on here? Let's go back. Let's go back to the screen. And I want to note Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, the Bible says, and out of one of them, remember now, this is out of one of the four horns that came up out of Greece. Out of one of them came forth a little horn, which we've already, decide, we've already seen is a kingdom which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. So now we got to ask ourselves a question, what kingdom can we look at that was rising at the end of the Grecian empire that waxed exceeding great? That's our question. What kingdom came after the Roman empire which waxed exceeding great and how did this kingdom war against the prince of princes and cast down the sanctuary? If we can find the answer to this question in Daniel chapter 8, what we're going to see is that what is, what is revealed in Daniel chapter 8 is a snapshot of a bigger picture of what we see in Daniel chapter 7. Let me see if I can rephrase it this way. The little horn in Daniel 8 comes first because it comes after Greece. So what we see in the first, let me say this, way, what we see in the first little horn of Daniel 8, we will see on a bigger scale in the little horn of Daniel 7. The Daniel chapter 8 horn is a, is a type of what the Daniel chapter 7 horn will do. Think of it this way. In Daniel chapter 8, we have a, we have a picture of, of the work of the little horn in one phase, which will parallel the work of the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 in a much larger phase. Okay, so let's break this down. How do we discover who this little horn of Daniel chapter 8 is? Well, let me tell you, and then I'm going to uh, prove this to you in another chapter of the book of Daniel. The little horn in Daniel chapter 8, the kingdom that came, that began to rise towards the end of the Grecian kingdom is the Roman Empire, what we would call pagan Rome. 
I want to read to you from the screen. The Macedonian Wars were a series of conflicts fought between the Roman Republic and the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedonia from 214 BC to 148 BC. These wars resulted in the gradual conquest of Macedonia by Rome and the establishment of the Roman dominance over the Eastern Mediterranean region. Thus, the conquest of Macedonia in 168 BC set in motion a process by which Rome gradually absorbed the entirety of Greece into its growing empire, transforming the Greek world into a vital part of the Roman civilization. In 64 BC, Rome conquers the Seleucid Empire. In 30 BC, Rome conquers Ptolemy's empire. In other words, Rome almost as it were assimilates one part of the Grecian empire and then grows out so much so that, that the process of Hellenization where Rome actually carried on or, or kept alive the, the culture uh, of Greece. This is what's being spoken about here. The horn, the little horn, this kingdom that, that as it were arose through the power of Greece arose through the territory of Greece, uh, 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 conquered one territory and then grew to uh, almost assimilate all of Greece is the Roman Empire. Why is this important to understand? I want you to note, this is the territory of Rome. When the Bible says that this kingdom waxed exceeding great, this is the territory that Rome would eventually conquer, beginning with the Macedonian War, beginning with conquering one part of the territory of Greece, and then ultimately assimilating all of Greece into its kingdom, and then growing beyond that. Why am I sharing this? Because there are people who believe that Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, a king who, 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 reigned within one of the four horns, not outside of the four horns, but within one of the four horns represents this little horn. And I just want to share this very quickly. Antiochus Epiphanes did not wax exceeding great. Let me read to you from the screen. Although Antiochus achieved temporary military successes, including his conquests in Egypt and efforts to consolidate power, his reign was marked by internal instability and resistance. His aggressive politics or policies, especially religious persecution, led to uprisings like the Maccabean Revolt, which contributed to the weakening of the Seleucid Empire. Moreover, his failure to maintain long-term control over Egypt and his confrontation with Rome further constrained his ambitions. In summary, while Antiochus Epiphanes did attempt to expand his kingdom, his efforts were not sustained and the empire suffered from internal rebellions and external pressures against his reign or, or during his reign. So, so what we see here, beloved, is that Antiochus Epiphanes could not possibly be this little horn that waxed exceeding great. Rome fits this power to a T. Now, please, I want you to note this. I want you to note what's going on here. The post-Greece phase of this little horn is symbolic of pagan Rome. So in Daniel chapter 8, we're looking primarily at pagan Rome, which will, be, which will set the stage for us to understand the little horn of Daniel 7, which, uh, which appears to rise after the fall of Rome. So, so pagan Rome will be a, a symbol or a type of a larger picture of this final end time enemy of God that rises after the fall of Rome. Please follow along with me because we're now going to the book of Daniel chapter nine. In Daniel chapter nine, Daniel is praying in vision, is praying and then receives or an angel comes to him to answer his prayer. Daniel is asking for understanding concerning the things he's seen in Daniel chapter eight. 
And in Daniel chapter 9, the Bible says, While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now note what he says next. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And listen to this, you guys. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. All right. Let's come back for a moment. Um... In Daniel chapter 9, this is a very well-known prophecy. This prophecy called the 70-week prophecy is pointing forward to the arrival of the Messiah, the Prince. Now, now remember this. In Daniel 8, whoever this little horn is, he, attack, he stands up against the Messiah and he destroys the sanctuary. He cast down the sanctuary. So when we get to Daniel 9 and we see, oh, here's a prophecy pointing to the arrival of the Messiah known as the 70 week prophecy or the 490 day prophecy. And this prophecy points to the arrival of the Messiah. And then the, the, this prince whose people destroy the sanctuary and put Jesus to death we can now begin to see, wait a minute, whoever this little horn is in Daniel 8, which rises after Greece, must also be present when Jesus is alive. Because the, the text says that he stands up against the prince of princes. He stands up against the prince of the host. So, Let's talk about this 70 week prophecy for a moment. And we're not gonna go into great detail. I'm just gonna put it up on the screen. We're just looking at the big picture of this prophecy. The angel tells Daniel that from the decree that goes forth to restore and to build Jerusalem, you will remember that Jerusalem had been destroyed by Babylon, the lion of Daniel 7. And it is not until a decree goes forward from the Medo-Persian Empire that allows the Jews to return and rebuild their temple and their city. That decree was given in 457 BC. It was given by the Medo-Persian Empire, meaning it was given by the ram in Daniel chapter 8 with the two horns, one horn higher than the other. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. The counting of this 70-week prophecy begins with the with the Medo-Persian Empire, with the empire symbolized by the ram with the two horns higher than the other. So then, if we count from 457 BC and we count 490 days, understanding that in the book of Daniel, a day equals a year, then you have 490 years. Note this on the screen, you guys. The 490 years takes us down to the very time of Jesus. Take 457, add 490 years. It brings you down to the lifetime of Jesus, uh, 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 culminating with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Now, let me ask you a question. What kingdom put Jesus to death? Whoever this little horn is in Daniel 8 had to stand up against the prince of princes. What kingdom put Jesus to death? Please note with me, guys, this is Rome. This is pagan Rome. Notice with me Daniel chapter 8, verse 10 again. Look at the screen. The Bible says of this little horn, it waxed great even to the hosts of heaven and cast on some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. The hosts of heaven would represent God's people. God's people. He stamped upon them. Verse 11, yea, he magnified himself to the prince of the host. Who would the prince of the host be? That is Jesus. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary cast down. The sanctuary was in essence desecrated. Now, please note this. When Jesus is about to die, in John 14, 28, he says this. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto my father for my father is greater than I. And now notice what he says next. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it happened, you may believe that when it come to pass, you may believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. Jesus announces the coming of this prince and he's talking about Satan himself. Is it possible, beloved, that the prince of the people that stand up against the Messiah and that destroy the city, could it be that that prince is ultimately a symbol of Satan himself? It's just as we said, the little horn in Daniel 8 is a small picture of a much greater power that will stand against God's people at the end of time. Now, I need y'all to check this out because I want to show you something here. Go with me. Go with me. We're going to go to the screen and we're going to look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And please note this very carefully. In Revelation 12, verse 1, the Bible says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Now watch verse 4, you guys. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born... And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now, beloved, I need y'all to catch this. The woman in Revelation chapter 12 represents the church. The child that is born to her represents Jesus. The dragon standing before the woman ready to devour her child is Satan. But listen to me, it is Satan working through a very specific kingdom. What kingdom was present that attempted to put Jesus to death when he was born? What kingdom is it that crucified Christ? It is the it was the Roman Empire. Exactly as Daniel chapter 8 says, this little horn would cast down the host of heaven. Just as we read in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon cast down the, a third of the stars. The dragon stood before the woman to devour the child. Just as the little horn in Daniel 8 would, would attempt to stand against the prince of princes. We find this amazing parallel that lets us know without a shadow of a doubt that this little horn in Daniel 8, which rises after Greece, can be none other than pagan Rome. And now that we have identified the little horn as pagan Rome rising after Greece, we now go back to the question, well, who is the little horn of Daniel 7, which rises 
after the fall of Rome. Let's go back to Daniel 7.25. The Bible says in Daniel 7.25, speaking of this little horn that rises after the fall of Rome, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until the time, times, and dividing of time. So here we see, whoa, look at that. Exactly what pagan Rome did in standing against Jesus and persecuting God's people, the little horn of Daniel 7 will also do. In other words, beloved, the little horn of Daniel 7 and the little horn of Daniel 8 are really the same horn, but in different phases. So what power then rose after pagan Rome, after the fall of pagan Rome, that would come upon the scene and persecute the people of God and as it were, or, 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 or attack a sanctuary. Well, this is a, a, another very well-known prophecy. This is the prophecy of the 1,260 years, the little horn in Daniel 7 that rose up, that started small and waxed exceeding great is none other than the papacy, the Roman Catholic system. The Roman, please listen to me carefully, the Roman Catholic system. The little horn in Daniel 8 represents pagan Rome, while the little horn in Daniel 7 represents papal Rome. Everything that pagan Rome did, in a literal sense, papal Rome would do after it in a spiritual sense. If I could rephrase it this way, the little horn of Daniel 8 is a, is a combination of both pagan Rome and then papal Rome. This 1260 year period represents the dark ages in which papal Rome persecuted the saints of the Most High and also diverted the minds of the people from the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus dwells and led them to focus on an earthly temple an earthly substitute. So don't pray to the high priest Jesus. Don't go to the heavenly sanctuary by faith to, 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 to commune with the high priest Jesus. No, come to the confessional booth and confess your sins to a human priest. Pray to a human priest who sits behind a veil in the place of God. Don't, don't trust in the word of God. Only we can, can, can interpret the word of God. So don't go to the word of God yourself. You got to come to us for understanding. You got to come to us for prayer. You got to come to us for forgiveness. This is what the little horn, this is how the little horn cast down the sanctuary in its papal phase. Now, I need y'all to understand this because this little horn is ultimately a symbol of mystery Babylon. Notice with me Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. The Bible says here, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. She's described as a woman sitting upon many waters, a whore. In the Bible, a woman is symbolic of, of Jesus's bride but, or the church. But here we have a whore, meaning a counterfeit church. Notice verse two. The, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. And the woman was arrayed in, note the colors here, purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. 
having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Oh, that's the same thing as Daniel chapter 8, persecuting or, 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 or warring against the hosts of heaven. It's the same thing as Daniel chapter 7. He will persecute the saints of the Most High. This is exactly the same thing we're reading in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So here we have a woman that is symbolizing a false church that is persecuting the people of God. Now, I just pointed out that this woman was decked in purple and scarlet. And why have I pointed that out? Because these colors are the colors of the Old Testament sanctuary. In fact, in Exodus 25 verse 4, when God is instructing the children of Israel on the material that he's going to require them to bring to build the Old Testament sanctuary, you will notice that he says, I need you to bring blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. The woman in Revelation chapter 17 is only wearing purple and scarlet. She is not wearing blue. 26 times in the Old Testament, the combination of purple, scarlet, and blue is used. Purple, scarlet, and blue. Purple, scarlet, and blue to describe the, 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 the garments of the priest and, and, the, and the ephod of the priest and, the, and the, 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 the constructing of the sanctuary. Purple, scarlet, and blue. Why blue? Why blue? In Numbers 15, verse 38, the Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make fringes in their borders of their garments throughout their generations, that they put upon the fringes of the borders of a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them. And that you seek not after your own heart or your own eyes, after which you go, what? A whoring. A whoring. To turn away from the commandments of God is to go a whoring. Blue is symbolic of the commandments of God. The woman in Revelation chapter 17 is not wearing blue. She's wearing, she's pretending to be the priesthood, but she is not wearing blue. Now note again with me how the book of Zephaniah describes this was apostate Israel, but I just want you to note some very important parallels here. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves and gnawing not the bone till tomorrow. They gnawed not the bone till tomorrow. <clears throat> Notice verse 4. Her prophets are light and treacherous, treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Let me ask you a question. How, according to this verse, is the sanctuary polluted? By doing violence to the law. It was this very system, beloved, the papacy, that during the Dark Ages not only a, a, a set up a counterfeit priesthood, but also change times and laws according to Daniel 7.25. What law specifically? The Sabbath commandment. They changed it from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Listen to me. Daniel 8, the little horn in its pagan phase, destro literally destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. They literally crucified Christ. That's how they stood up against him. But the little horn in its papal phase symbolically stands up against Jesus by putting a priesthood in his place saying, come and confess your sins to us. 
That's how they stood up against the Prince of Princes. And they cast down the truth of the sanctuary by changing the law and by turning men's attention from a heavenly sanctuary to a earthly counterfeit with counterfeit priests, counterfeit incense, counterfeit sacrifices. This is the sacrifice of Christ. He's literally dying over and over again every time we break the bread. Everything was counterfeited. It was a counterfeit system designed to counterfeit the truth taught by our heavenly high priest who was now dwelling in a heavenly sanctuary. This woman was not wearing blue. Daniel 7.25, he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out or persecute the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times and the dividing of time. That's 1,260 days, which we see if the 490 days were actually 490 years, bringing us down to the time of Christ, then the 1,260 days is actually 1,260 years after the fall of Rome. This is what is known as the Dark Ages. Now notice verse 26, beloved. This is going to come right back to Daniel chapter 8 and that 2300 day prophecy. We've seen the 490 days equals 490 years. We've seen the 1260 days equals 1260 years, which must mean that the 2300 days in Daniel 8, which said this little horn would do its thing uh, 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 and then things would be cleansed at this 2300 day mark must represent 2300 years please note with me Daniel 7 verse 26 after Daniel beholds this little horn dominating for 1260 years the next thing he says is this but the judgment shall sit the thrones that's what he's talking about the throne set up remember what we said the thrones pointed to the thrones pointed to the sanctuary of God the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume it until the end. All right. This is what parallels, beloved, Daniel seeing thrones set up after he's watching the rule of the little horn. And now this brings us back to Daniel 9, verse 24. In Daniel 9, verse 24, when the angel comes to explain to Daniel what he had seen in Daniel 8, the angel says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. The word there for determined is cut off. 70 weeks are cut off from what? 490 days, that's 70 weeks. 490 days, 490 years are cut off from what? In Daniel chapter 8, Daniel, the angel explains to Daniel who the ram is, who the he goat is, what the little horn does, but he never explains the 2300 days. So when the angel comes back in Daniel 9, he's telling him 70 weeks are cut off from the 2300 days. Let me break this down for you. Remember that the decree given in Daniel chapter 9 would extend to the coming of the Messiah. That decree was given in 457 BC. That decree was given in the, in the empire of the, uh, of the ram with the two horns, one higher than the other, the Medo-Persian empire. So what the angel is telling us, beloved, is that this 2300 day prophecy must extend from the Medo-Persian empire through to Greece, through to the little horn in its pagan phase and ultimately the little horn in its papal phase. Meaning the 2300 days cannot be literal days. It must be years, 2300 years. And, and, and note this, the angel says, start counting from the decree that goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem. That's 457 BC. Note with me on the screen, if we start in 457 BC and you add that 490 years, 
that, that surrounds the pagan phase of the little horn. It brings you down to the Roman Empire. It brings you down to the time of Jesus. It ends in 34 AD. That means if you take 490 years or 70 weeks, 490 years from 2300, it leaves 1810 days. If you were to add 1810 days to 34 AD, it brings you to the year 1844. What's going to happen in 1844? By the way, 1844 is after that 1260 year period, which the little horn in its papal phase would dominate. So what happens in 1844, what's going to happen in 1844? The Bible tells us that the sanctuary would be cleansed, meaning the way that the papacy defiled the sanctuary was by disregarding or changing the law, specifically the Sabbath commandment. By 1844, God would bring a movement on the scene that would restore the law of God, beginning the process of cleansing, cleansing the sanctuary. Beloved, I need you to understand and catch this because you're going to find that exactly what happened in the 70 week portion of, of, of Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, where pagan Rome defiles the sanctuary, where pagan Rome stands up against Jesus, where pagan Rome uh, uh, casts down the sanctuary of God and persecutes the people of God, the same thing is happening in a, uh, uh, on a larger scale with the spiritual phase of the little horn, the papal phase of the little horn. The prophecy is telling us that the little horn will be able to get away with this until the end of this 2300 years in which something amazing is going to happen. The truth is going to be restored and, and, and God's uh, law is going to be restored. The persecution of God's people having come to an end, something is going to happen that is going to bring about a restoration of the truth. And beloved, please note with me in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, where the Bible records this message. The Bible says in verse 6, I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. The same thing Daniel sees when he watches the little horn doing his thing for 1260 years and then sees thrones set down, which points us to the sanctuary, which Daniel 8 says is a cleansing of the error brought about by this little horn that would do violence to the law of God. Revelation 14, 6 is telling us that this judgment hour arrives in 1844, the hour of his judgment has come. And then it says, worship him that made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Beloved, this is a message that is to go into the whole world. And God is inviting you to be a part of the people preaching this very message. In 1844, beloved, God brought upon the scene the Seventh-day Adventist church whose emphasis is the law of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, whose emphasis is that the judgment hour has begun and has been going on since 1844. <coughs> And, and, and everyone in the world must hear this message. That's what Revelation 14, 6 is pointing to. This everlasting gospel that is to be preached into the whole world and then the end comes. Note this angel's message. It says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. That last phrase 
is taken directly from the fourth commandment found in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, verse 11 reading, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13, and 14, the Bible says this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It is interesting to know, beloved, that the second angel's message, which comes right after that message of judgment, is this. There followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then in Revelation 18, verse 4, it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin, and that you receive not of her plagues. God is calling a people into this truth, <clears throat> and out of fallen churches that reject the law of God. This message, beloved, began to go forward in 1844, and this movement prophesied in the Bible began to go forward in 1844. I need to share one more thing with you as we close. You see, beloved, at the end of that 70-week prophecy, pagan phase, the, the, the pagan phase of the little horn, something very interesting happened. The disciples of Jesus misunderstood this 70-week prophecy. They thought Jesus was coming to set up a kingdom on earth. But when he died, their hopes were shattered. They experienced a great disappointment. They were embarrassed. They had been believing that Jesus was coming to set up a kingdom on earth and they were embarrassed. They hid for shame. But beloved, when they understood that Jesus through his death had ascended into a heavenly sanctuary, something amazing happened. That which was their great disappointment became the cornerstone of their movement and it grew by leaps and bounds. They would excitedly tell people how they were mistaken about the prophecy. This was the cornerstone of their movement and it grew by leaps and bounds. It is so interesting that in 1844, many of the people who had discovered this prophecy from all different denominations thought that Jesus was coming to the earth to set up a kingdom. And guess what? They were mistaken. They were wrong. It was called the great disappointment. Google it. People make fun of it to this day. Just as atheists and skeptics mock the death, burial, and ascension of Christ, so the same thing happened with this prophecy of the 2300 days. And yet, beloved, what was a great disappointment to this movement became the cornerstone, the very foundation of this church showing that Jesus had been behind this prophecy, that while, the, while they thought Jesus was going to come to earth and got the prophecy wrong, got the event wrong, there was something much greater happening. Thrones were being set up for the judgment to begin for the final message to go forward into all the world before Jesus comes again and finally destroys every anti-Christian power and sentiment standing against him and his law. <clears throat> and beloved, today God invites you to be a part of this absolutely mind-blowing, amazing prophecy. So the question is, will I be a part of those who mocked, like in the days of the disciples of Jesus? <clears throat> or will I be a part of those who believe and grab a hold of this message and go forward with that angel, that message to fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man.
It is my prayer <clears throat> that your choice will be to keep the commandments of God and to be a part of this end time movement that is going forth with a very special message to love God, to keep his commandments, and to have the testimony of Jesus. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that this message today has spoken and revealed the truth of your word. Lord, it is all there in history for us to see and to follow. Please, Lord, speak to your people. Draw them by your spirit. <clears throat> And may this truth go into all the world. We know the enemy will fight it. We know the enemy will seek to, to, to uh, lead people to disregard this message. But Lord, may your message advance and may your people who have your heart and your spirit hear it and respond. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. May God bless you. For those of you who want a copy of these slides, uh, you will see a QR code at the end of this. Uh, make sure to scan it. You can also scan the QR code to follow us on social media. And may God bless you as you continue to walk and to live in truth. Amen.